Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Hunt. I'm the founder of The Bovine, and on behalf of The Bovine Zoetis and Holstein USA, I'm glad that you for today's very informative webinar, Moving Beyond Phenotype, Genomics versus Size-Based Traits. With that, it is my honor to introduce David Erf. David comes a technical services representative uh, for Soweta, specifically in the clarified uh, department, but he has a wealth of knowledge of over 20 years experience in the artificial and insemination industry and the dairy breeding industry, as well as he also uh, comes from a registered uh, brown Swiss herd that shows and uh, exhibits and breeds great cattle. So it's with that that we're very fortunate to have uh, David join us today, and I will pass control over of today's presentation to David. Okay, Andrew. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, this is our sixth in our series that Zoetis and the Holstein Association together has presented for uh, uh, genomic webinars. And today's topic, I'm going to change it a little bit on what Andrew said there. It's basically the same thing. Today we're going to do some new learnings from uh, genomic testing. Uh, having genomics versus uh, size-based traits and average daily gain information. And again, my name is Dave Erf, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. Like I said, this is our sixth in our series. There's one more after this. And uh, today we're going to uh, dive a little deeper into learning about different ways to use genomic information, putting it to work a little bit more and uh, getting that uh, value out of the genomic testing and looking at uh, things that we can do to uh, utilize that information more. So in today's webinar, we're going to uh, talk about some common standards used in raising heifers, uh, review a little bit about what genetics and environment uh, work together to create, and we'll compare genomic size estimates versus height and weight estimates and uh, visit some issues. First, we'll talk about when heifers should start being bred and how we can use genomic information to maybe fine tune that a little more in our operations. And uh, the second uh, area we'll talk about is what is my best measure in calves to predict future performance. So first, we'll talk about uh, some common standards that are used for raising heifers. Uh, some commonly held standards that are out there is to begin breeding heifers based on established height and weight standards. So now with genomic data available on size traits, is that a, still a true area? or can we focus a little more on age using that genomic data and putting it to work out there? Also, we're going to look at average daily gain information and look at it at an early age and in uh, some instances a little later on, even to look at that and compare it to genomic estimates when evaluating future milk production and look at that and say with genomics available, which one tells us more? So first, we're going to talk a little bit about genetics and environment and how it's an interactive relationship. This is a little bit of review. We've seen this slide many times, but we just want to uh, uh, kind of uh, reinforce this thought process that genetics is part of the whole comprehensive improvement strategy for your herd. So uh, genetics is kind of like the hub in the wheel. and in order to get the most out of genetics, we need everything working together to make sure that all the areas of our herd health and uh, other areas are uh, at top notch so we can get the most out of our genetics. But we also need our genetics to be at the highest level to get the most out of our investment in our other areas of herd health. So genetics are different with a within a herd's average management level. Let's say your herd has excellent management, but your genetic average is mediocre. Then your 
milk average that you get, you'll get a variation. You'll get some animals that will be low. You'll get some animals that will be high. But your herd potential is capped out at your herd's genetic potential. With good management, we get a little less variation. And we've got some lost dollars there because our management isn't good enough to get the most out of our genetics. And if we have poorer management, we really lose uh, some of our genetic potential, and our variation decreases even more. Now, if we could raise that genetic potential, all of a sudden we see that if we've got excellent management, we can get more milk out of our cows just by raising that genetic potential, whereas we're not going to get as much from that if we only have good or poor management. So it's important to make sure that our management levels are high to get the most out of those animals and keep that management level and our genetics as high as we can. So now we have genomic estimates for uh, body size and how well do those, do those genomic estimates work. So we took data from three herds that uh, Zoetis uh, has done some genomic testing with. Uh, the first herd we gathered some data from had uh, some weight data at birth, uh, post weaning, and then around 170 days old when those animals returned from uh, a heifer grower. The second herd uh, got the weight uh, data at birth. And again, at five months of age and then near breeding age. And they also had height data from near breeding age. And the third herd only recorded height data near breeding age. All these herds were doing genomic testing, so uh, we have genomic information to uh, correlate to their own phenotypic responses. And each herd has different management levels and growth rates, so we evaluated each one separately. So let's take a look at genomic estimates versus body measures, and let's first look at stature. Here we have the association between genomic stature and adjusted height at 365 days uh, for a large group of heifers from the same herd. And here you can see that we get a nice correlation between uh, genomic estimates for stature and the heifer's height at a year of age. So when we're looking at this, we can say, is this a place we can utilize genomic information rather than waiting for heifers to reach a certain height? It looks like genomic data works very well. As you can see, uh, we get some differences in animals that are at the same age for height, but we can explain a good portion of that with their genetics. Here's the second herd, and we can see that the correlation of hip height to the original uh, genomic standardized transmitting ability for stature was 0.61, so it's pretty high. So for each point of genomic stature we moved, these heifers got 8.87 inches taller at breeding age or around a year of age. So we've got a nice correlation there of original genomic estimate for stature and uh, the deviation in breeding height there. So you can see there that uh, uh, determining when these heifers reach breeding uh, height, we can pretty much look at their genomic information and kind of utilize that into determining, you know, is this heifer uh, big enough to breed or is she not looking at them? So if we can predict future differences in future size at an earlier point in time, we can use those predictions to better explain and manage animals. So basically, now can we look at those animals at breeding size, and rather than holding back a group of heifers that are smaller, waiting them to be larger, can we look at their genomics and say, hey, they're ones that were predicted to be smaller. They're probably going to be smaller cows. They're probably reaching the size we need because we've managed them well, is to go ahead and breed them at that time rather than waiting back and holding them back for a couple months, waiting for them to reach that 
uh, size. So when we manage animals to a predefined standard phenotype, we accelerate emphasis on that stature. So if we place a, uh, a specific height standard for breeding, we'll increase that emphasis we place on taller animals, which may not fit into the herd's goals if they're trying to maintain a certain body size on their mature cows. We might actually be promoting animals that are larger so that they get bred sooner. And that might not fit into what we want long term. So let's look at genomic estimates versus other body measures like uh, growth, strength, and body size. In this, we're going to see how well does genomic predict future overall body size, and can we use this information to better manage heifers? And many herds and heifers, uh, raisers, they use weight standards to determine breeding time, and we can look at that and say, uh, can we come up with a better measure for determining when uh, breeding size uh, is hit? So here we have uh, genomic estimates uh, versus weight at about a year of age, and we're comparing it to genomic PTAs for body composite. And here we can see a nice correlation between the two, and we can see that uh, with a 75-pound difference in uh, age at the same range, we hit animals that are uh, quite a few animals that are predicted to be in that range with genomic estimates. So we could use genomic body composite index uh, to kind of predict what animals should weigh at breeding time, and maybe we can use that measure rather than uh, trying to get animals to hit a certain weight. Here we've got uh, genomic estimates uh, versus weight at uh, about a year of age, and we use that compared to the estimate for strength. And here we see maybe even a little tighter uh, correlation with uh, strength and that adjusted weight at a uh, year of age. And we can see that uh, we can do a pretty good job of predicting who are going to be the uh, heavier animals and who will be the lighter ones, and we can determine that off their genomic information and kind of explain when we see an animal that's a little bit lighter at uh, breeding time is maybe she'll be the one that'll be a little smaller when she becomes a cow, so is waiting a couple months to breed her to uh, have her gain some more weight, is that going to help us in the long run, or is she just going to be one of my smaller frame cows, maybe even a more efficient cow, that I should be breeding at the same time as I'm breeding the heavier heifers. This chart shows uh, the association between genomic strength and average daily gain from uh, birth to breeding age. And here we can look and say that genomic estimate for strength can uh, predict average daily gain, and we see a nice correlation there too. So if you're using uh, average daily gain uh, to breeding age to kind of figure out which animals are ready to breed and which ones you should wait on, maybe uh, genomics is a, is a better solution to show us which animals are going to be ones that are going to be bigger at certain ages. And this one also shows... Uh, looks at genomic strength and average daily gain to about 170 days old and a very tight relationship here that uh, we, so we see that as we increase on genomic strength, we increase on our average daily gain, which makes sense that our bigger framed animals are going to gain a little more weight a little faster. And this shows the association between genomic strength an average daily gain from birth to about 80 days of age or weaning shortly after weaning. And it'll show that uh, we see there the animals we expect to be bigger framed uh, in the long run are the ones that gain quicker as calves. And so we want to make sure that we're not biasing ourselves against those smaller growth rate calves that are still going to be good cows. They're going to be healthy animals that uh, are going to be really efficient cows, but may just be smaller frame cows. So we can use genomic information to kind of look at 
our healthy animals and make better decisions on uh, when we're going to do breeding times or calving ages and all those kind of things that genomics can help us with. So genomics can improve our decisions. We can use genomics to help estimate group weights and heights within the herds. And remember, if we're using height or weight restriction or weight uh, minimums on when we're starting to breed animals, is to remember how big is big enough for our heifers. Uh, selecting for that increased early growth and getting them to uh, breeding age earlier uh, may result in selecting for larger animals when they're mature. And we need to make sure we're placing some of our emphasis on more on efficiency of animals, is to not bias ourselves against those smaller framed uh, cows that we can predict that information when they're heifers. And remember that genetics are permanent and additive in impact size. So let's look at how new genomic knowledge, like uh, uh, looking at our type traits like strength and body composite and stature, uh, can impact our selection decisions. So first issue we'll look at here is when is the optimum time to start breeding heifers? Currently, producers have many options when they determine to start breeding heifers. Some use a specific height, 50 inches, for example, when a heifer reaches uh, the mark in a pen that some people run heifers by. They reach that mark, it's time to start breeding them. Some look at weight, and they look at uh, some historical studies that say breed at approximately whatever percent of target mature size. And also, some look at uh, age and just start breeding at a set age, regardless of the status of the previous two measures, so long as the animal is healthy. And we're saying this one may not be used as much as it should with the influence of genomic data. So which method would be best here? Well, it depends. We don't have a complete answer for that. But consider what we've just learned from genomics. It helps us predict height variation between heifers, heifer groups at breeding age. And it helps us predict how much heifers weigh and how much they can gain. So how important would it be to your herd to tighten that age at first calving if possible, rather than having some animals that uh, you hold back for a few months waiting for them to hit those target numbers for height or weight? How about looking at the genomic data and saying, hey, they're going to be my smaller animals. It was predicted that at breeding age, they might be a little on the smaller end. They're healthy. They're probably just going to be smaller cows. Let's go ahead and breed them with the rest of the group. And maybe we tighten up our age at first calving by uh, a month or a couple months on those animals. And that's going to save us a lot of money in the long range when you look at how much fewer replacements we need on our herd if we can tighten up that age at first calving uh, some. So some observations is that breeding by height may promote taller or bigger cows. And we got to make sure that uh, if our target is that we're breeding them when they hit a certain height, <clears throat> that we watch that and make sure that, uh, that we're not placing more emphasis on stature than we need to in our uh, herd selection. Because we don't want to make a herd of uh, cows that don't fit into our operation. So breeding by weight sometimes may be difficult to uh, measure if we're not dealing with scales on farms. And uh, uh, breeding by age may be the easiest to follow of all of these, uh, with few ramifications if we're making sure that they're all healthy animals that we're breeding. Now on to the meat of the topic, which is genetics and early age average daily gain in predicting future milk production. Most of this comes about from a foundational Cornell study that was 
uh, collecting data for many years and compared milk production to uh, many early life measurements, and one of those included average daily gain. And what the Cornell study uh, found uh, was that uh, average daily gain in uh, pre-weaning uh, calves uh, had a very high correlation with uh, future milk production. It uh, showed that for uh, each kilogram of average daily gain we increased, we increased uh, average daily gain by 849 pounds, which was very significant. And we saw a similar response in the second lactation on those same animals. So with that Cornell study evaluating pre-weaning average daily gain and uh, pre-breeding average daily gain versus milk production, uh, the results, uh, the heifers produced approximately 1,800 pounds of uh, more milk in the first lactation for every pound increase in pre-weaning average daily gain. Is average daily gain? Yes, it is important. Uh, it stresses the need to raise healthy calves to maximize their genetic potential. But with genomic data, can we do a better job of predicting which animals will produce more? So with that and uh, thought, uh, we've seen some advertisements and other uh, statements out there that growth rate may have more effect on milk yield than genetic selection for production. And now we have uh, more accurate genomic evaluations for an animal's potential uh, future production. We wanted to see which one is actually a better predictor of future production and which is a uh, better tool to use in early life uh, decisions for which animals we keep in the herd. So we had uh, information to compare some early life growth rates and genomic predictions uh, on future production. We had uh, two large dairy herds that had some uh, growth data and had genomically tested their animals and provided that data to examine the effectiveness of using each of these measures to predict future production. And so the objective was to look at genomic data and average daily gain measurements and look at their predictive uh, future milk production using those as selection tools. So here's what we saw in the first herd. We looked at the association between average daily gain from birth to weaning and looked at first lactation 305-day ME milk production. And we got very similar responses to what the Cornell study did. For each pound of average daily gain increased in this herd, we saw an increase in first lactation milk production of almost 1,300 pounds. But when we looked at the data, we looked at that R-squared value, which is something we uh, look at statistically, it explains how much of the total variation can we explain with uh, our estimate here? So how much of the milk production variation can we explain with the average daily gain? And you can see here that we explain less than 1% of the variation. When we look at the same animals and rank them on uh, their original PTA for milk from genomic estimates, we saw a nice response. We got a response of 3.4 pounds for every pound of PTA milk. We increased it where we expected two pounds. And we look at that, and we saw that our total variation that was explained with genomic estimates for milk as calves for these two-year-olds was about 18% of the total variation. So when we compare these side by side in this herd, we can look at these two charts and say, well, which one would we like to utilize to select our next generation of elite animals or animals that maybe we don't need to raise? And uh, looking at these two, you can see that the slope for the genomic estimate was very much steeper and gave us more extremes to select from for each end. 
So we went one step further. Both of this herd was uh, looking at calling out the bottom 15% of their uh, heifer crop. And uh, if we took their estimates on average daily gain and called out that bottom 15%, we wanted to see how much could we increase the remainder animals for uh, ME milk production for that first lactation. And with calling that bottom 15%, we could raise ME milk production by 25 uh, pounds of ME milk. When we take that same 15% off based on genomic estimates for uh, milk, we can increase that uh, remaining group by 466 pounds. And we can see that uh, with that, uh, uh, we can see that the summary for this herd is that we can make about 18 times more improvement in this herd for milk production using genomic estimates than using average daily gain. The average daily gain was slightly less than what Cornell saw, but for each one-tenth of a pound of average daily gain, we could increase uh, production by 129 pounds in that first lactation uh, for that herd using average daily gain. But for the genomic estimates, uh, calling that bottom 15% gave us much more improvement in that uh, increasing the group's first lactation ME milk average. In our second herd, we looked at, we had multiple estimates for uh, average daily gain. We had uh, from birth to approximately five uh, months of age. And we looked at their first lactation 305-day ME milk. And we can see here that we had a much uh, steeper slope. It was for every pound of average daily gain that was increased, we increased by 2,666 pounds of milk. But our R-squares were still small at just over 1%. And that slope was pretty flat. When we look at the same group, uh, we looked also at their average daily gain to approximately one year of age or close to breeding age. And we looked at their future first lactation ME milk production. And you can see there that our slope got a little steeper. Now at a year of age, we've got a few more environmental issues we can look at and call out those uh, bottom enders and look at those poor doers. Uh, that slope was up to 4,321. Uh, pounds on that slope. So it looks like it's really improving, but our R squareds really didn't improve a lot. We got up to almost 2.5% on this group. Now looking at those same groups and looking at their original genomic estimates that we got as calves, uh, we see we got a slope of 3.1, which was pretty steep. We expected to. And here we got an R squared of 10%. So 10% of our variation was explained using genomic estimates. Now, if we called the bottom 15%, it was uh, with the average daily gain at a year of age. So we're giving average daily gain all the way up to a year. And we can call out the bottom 15% at that point. We increased the ME average of the remainder group by 191 pounds of milk. When we do the same thing with the genomic milk estimates and we remove the bottom 15% based on the original genomic PTA for milk, we improved the remainder group by 482 pounds. So we got much more improvement with the genomic estimates removing the bottom end. So in summary on this HERD2 study, uh, we see that uh, average daily gain for this group was a little bit uh, more in relationship with milk production and uh, actually had more milk gain than the Cornell study showed. But the variation explained was still relatively small compared to what the variation was explained with the genomic estimate. And calling out the bottom 15% on average daily gain uh, was less than half 
uh, improvement that we saw with genomic estimates. In fact, the genomic estimates were two and a half times more milk improvements by calling out the bottom 15% than average daily gain. So in summary, we want to uh, reinforce that management is very important, and it works hand in hand to allow genetics to be fully expressed. Remember that example of good, of excellent good and poor management, that we need to have the best management we can to get the most out of our genetics. But remember that genetics are permanent and can be passed on to the next generation. Management and environmental effects do not transmit to the next generation where genetics are. They're additive and they're permanent. Genetic selection for size impacts growth rates. Most producers don't want big cows, uh, cows that are too big for their stalls. So let's look at our old standards for our first heifer service breeding decisions and look at genomic data as another way to maybe fine-tune when we start breeding those heifers. We can utilize this information to help us uh, tighten up that age at first calving, and that way we can have fewer heifers in our heifer pens and get them into the milking string earlier, and that's going to make us more money in our operations out there. So in these two case studies that we looked at for average daily gain, it was uh, the average daily gain improvement, we had similar impact on first lactation milk as we saw in the Cornell study. Their information was dead on that uh, animals that uh, had better average daily gains uh, did produce more milk. However, when we're looking at what's the most efficient way to look at young animals and predict uh, future milk production, genomic milk predictions, uh, still had a larger and more consistent relationship in predicting future milk production when compared to using those average daily gain measurements. So the take-home message is we need to select for the best genetics and then feed and manage them right. As I often hear, we can have the best genetics, but if we don't take care of those animals right, they're not going to live up to their uh, full potential of what they can do. So we need to make sure we're maximizing our genetic progress and our herd progress by having the best genetics and the best management. So let's feed and manage them right, but let's also select for the best genetics we can. So the next session for the webinar series will be Dr. Dan Weigel talking about making genetic progress on low heritability traits. So now I'm going to turn it back to Andrew and open it up for any questions. Thank you, David. And I'm just regaining control. And uh, I am reminding people that uh, if you have any more questions, please get them into us, though I do have a few three or four uh, to get going. So we will go from there. The first question that has come in um, is, has there been developed physical size and genomic potential size that is in use now to determine time of breeding. What was that again, Andrew? You has, there been a protocol, has there been a protocol or process uh, or best practices developed uh, linking the information that you show here, like the information between physical size and genomic potential, the time of breeding? So you mentioned before about uh, uh, that I, be I think it. Yeah, I, I think it's looking at that average daily gain information was our big one. Both of both of these herds, uh, what we saw is that uh, is the animals that their genetic potential. We have some smaller animals that have some high genetic potential and end up being pretty good uh, production animals. They're just going to be smaller. And uh, what we were trying to look at was, can we predict the difference in size and uh, look at those smaller animals, and rather than waiting to breed them, can we go ahead and breed them earlier? And they'll hit that same uh, genetic mark. As far as getting detailed into it, we haven't uh, gotten re real detailed. We just wanted to look at and say, uh, you know, the tendencies 
out there are to hold those heifers open for a month or two months and let them catch up size-wise. And what we end up with are those animals stay smaller as um, mature cows, but we just spend another couple months raising them that maybe we didn't need to. Uh, maybe that's a area that there can be more future study in, uh, but for right now, uh, the information that we see says that uh, if you're raising them well, uh, get them up to a certain age and go ahead and start breeding them would probably be the best uh, advice I could give is to not worry too much that uh, she needs to get another inch or two. If she's healthy and she's at that age that you want to see them uh, calf in, go ahead and get her bred. And a question that goes with that, and a question that I have myself as I was watching this is, we these traits as trying to be a performer of reproductive maturity. Um, and the question I had here was, what's a more accurate predictor of reproductive maturity? Is it age or was it size? Well, I, I think that that would uh, depend more on the on the animal and what you uh, consider for size. Uh, I've heard a lot of places that breed for uh, stature that, you know, we get some of those animals that are the uh, tall, narrower animals and we they hit that uh, height standard and we go ahead and breed them and they calve in and they spend their whole first lactation trying to fill out the body that uh, they weren't quite there yet. I think that the body composite and the strength uh, information is much more revealing to me on which animals are the ones that are reaching that uh, desired area there. And we can do a good job with that, with those genomic estimates of looking at what's the proper uh, point for those animals is not waiting for them to reach a certain weight or uh, a frame size is looking for what are the differences we can expect in that group at that age and not waiting for them all to hit that one point. And that's where genomics can come in and help us and show us that, hey, we expect this animal to be a little smaller framed and she's hit the age where most of my animals are uh, getting bred, but she's a little bit on the small side. Can I explain it with genomic estimates and utilize the genomic information to help us in those decisions? And I think that's where uh, this fits in. Uh, I do get a little leery of just looking at uh, hip height or uh, stature height at the withers and using that as the lone, uh, lone uh, determiner of if they're their breeding size or not. Okay. Uh, and a very key thing, since a lot of people do t t a mark on the wall, as you say, or the 50-inch marker, that's similar typically as the breeding age one, um, and maybe even just as a general best practice is if she's a little thin or a little frailer in the frame to maybe give her a little more time, even though she's hit that height mark, to give her time to mature. And conversely, on the younger, on the older ones who are a little older but smaller, maybe breed them a little sooner than hitting that mark because maybe they're a tall cow, but they do have enough substance uh, to breed at yes. an earlier age. Yes, it works. it works both ways in that sometimes we see some heifers that hit a height mark at uh, a month or two before uh, their desired start time of uh, breeding usually is, and they say, well, they're hitting that height mark, go ahead and breed them. Uh, you know, that may be, uh, looks nice that they hit that hip, that height mark that we have out in the pen, and then they calve in and we're, we're uh, getting them off to a slow start because they're still trying to grow. And we're looking at that, and what this information says is we have genomic information to give us the variances in uh, the animals. It tells us a little bit more about which ones are going to be our big ones, which ones are going to be our small ones. And as long as we're raising them well, and that's the important part of this, and that's what the Cornell study kind of showed us is we need to raise our heifers well. Yes. In some herds, that's maybe not given as much attention as it should, but certainly can be a lifelong uh, effect on the profitability of your animals if they don't get off to a good start in life. Um, 
one of the other questions that come in is, what is the correlation between body condition or body composite, DPR, and productive life in a lactating herd? I know you did the, uh, you put up a slide about the correlations between different traits, and someone was asking if there has a similar uh, correlation data been analyzed for those particular traits. For productive life and and DPR. And by and BDC body composite, yeah. Uh, well, I haven't seen anything with body composite and productive life uh, other than uh, than studies that have shown that uh, smaller body size animals uh, last longer out there. And that's what we look at in the U.S. on the net merit formulas. We have a, a negative weighting on body size because we know that um, smaller size animals do last longer. Uh, those studies have been done. Um, we've seen studies on herds that bred for larger and smaller cows, and what we see with uh, with those with that information was that while the larger cows had an advantage in uh, less mastitis because their udders were uh, more tighter to the body, the smaller cows had a lot more advantage in uh, mobility issues and. Uh, um, Less DAs, less metabolic issues, uh, but the the smaller animals did last longer in those studies, and uh, it's a more moderate sized uh, cow seemed to uh, last longer. So, uh, trying to place emphasis on uh, growth rates gets us bigger cows. So, is it it might be fighting us with uh, the longevity issue? I'd have to look up the data to uh, uh, correlate that. To, get the exact correlations, but uh, we know productive life and DPR are very highly correlated, and uh, uh, the body traits would be slightly negative correlated. The larger the animal, the less longevity and uh, the less reproductively efficient they are as we increase size. Okay, great. Um, I had a question come in. I'm just got them out of order here, but I got one here that came in that I think is a very good question. Is if we have accurate pedigree information, do we need to use genomics, or can we just use the pedigree information? Well, that's a that's a good question, and I think that comes back to a uh, talk of reliability. Is uh, how reliable are those estimates? And yes, if we've got a handle on parentage, that's great. We don't have the parentage issues but we still have how accurate or how reliable are those issues, are those estimates. And that's where genomics really comes in to shine is we increase that reliability level. So uh, when we're increasing that reliability level, what we're doing is we're, uh, we have a confidence level. We've got that estimate of uh, whatever trait it is, whether it be stature or, or utter depth or uh, strength or body composite, we've got that estimate. And what we've got is a reliability level. And if the lower that reliability level is, the more variance we can, we'll can we see in that estimate, is that if we estimate that this animal's uh, average for size, she could have a variance where she could be well above average or way below average if it's a parent average estimate. If it's a genomic estimate, we kind of more pinpoint where that animal's actually going to be is on that scale. Is she going to be a little bit above, a little bit below, with much more reliability and thus more accuracy? So the genomic estimates just let us fine tune uh, that information, and basically it's, it's better information is what we're finding out, just like it is for milk production and longevity and the other traits, the type traits fall right in line with that on genomic estimates. Yeah, and one of the things I think maybe there, and maybe David, you could, if there's more to it, but uh, again, a parentage average or parentage estimate, we're using an assumption that it's 50% father, 50% mother. And I think one thing we've learned thanks to uh, genomics is, while it may average out that way over the uh, with each animal, there can actually be quite a variance that one maybe lends a little more towards mother or father or outperforms both uh, well, in they, their actual performance than what their parent average would say. Well, that it's true that uh, you get 50% of your genes from your mother and 50% from your father, but it's about uh, which genes from your mother and father did you get. 
did you get all the size genes from your uh, father that's uh, six foot five inches tall, or did you get all your uh, stature genes from your mother that's five foot three? And looking at that variance of where, what genes did you get? We get 50% of our inheritance from our father and from our mother, but we do not get 25% from each uh, grandparent. So genomics kind of helps us pinpoint as to did we get the good genes, did we get the bad genes, uh, what did we get? So we get to explain that variation from parent average. Are we above, are we below? So it, that's, it's an important part, and you're right there, Andrew, that uh, uh, we get 50% of our genes from our parents, but we don't know which 50% do we get. Do we get good ones? Do we get bad ones? And that's what genomics helps us is to take a little peek into the future of those dairy animals and look and, and see what are they going to be like. Are they going to be a tall cow? Are they going to be a, uh, a shorter animal? Are they going to be frail? Are they going to be strong? And uh, genomics helps us that way. We've seen it work on milk production, on uh, health traits. Now we're saying we can use that information and look at size traits too. On behalf of uh, uh, the bovine as well as uh, Zoetis and uh, Holstein USA, I want to thank uh, David for taking the time to share with us this very eye opening information. I think we've all kind of used that uh, height or age as our breeding numbers and just kind of started going uh, on that information uh, as the way. And I think that the insight that we get from genomics telling us, hey, maybe there's reasons why that big heifer shouldn't be bred just yet because she needs I don't know, maybe that small heifer uh, is big enough for what she needs to be for the type of cow she's going to be over her lifetime we need to make uh, when the heifer in the genomics has proven that it can show us a lot of information early in life to help us uh, manage our herds uh, and our cattle throughout their lifetime much more effectively. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, if there's any more questions or questions that uh, people have, David, uh, uh, is there a best way, way to uh, kind of get a hold of you or would you like them to come through us to help uh, ask any further questions they might have? Well, first, I want to say thank you, Andrew, for coordinating this. We very much appreciate it at Zoetis. And if anyone has any questions that they want to uh, contact me about, my uh, email address is david.erf, E-R-F, at zoetis.com. And feel free to contact me with any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but we do appreciate it. We hope everyone uh, enjoyed it. I will remind everyone that our final uh, webinar in this initial series uh, it goes on January 6th, where we have uh, the always uh, dynamic David Weigel uh, sharing with us how to make progress on low heritability traits and how genomics can help us uh, focus on areas that maybe we thought weren't uh, high enough heritability to incorporate into your breeding strategies. Uh, but now, uh, thanks to this technology that you can and make advancements in these traits that typically were hard to breed for. So we look forward to that session and we appreciate for everyone joining us today.